Before this video starts, I just want to thank all of you for over 100 views on my Spinopharism video. Also, I just want to say thank you to my friend Chameleons for promoting my video, and for that, I think you guys should subscribe to them. Anyway, on to the video. So, welcome back to something, I guess. Uh, today, I will be talking about the paleo artist David Peters. David Peters was a once reliable paleo artist that later turned into uh, whatever this is. Uh, since his fall from glory, he has become a very controversial figure in the paleontology community. He's had his fair share of criticism uh, from people like Darren Nash, Dino Diego, and Trey the Explainer. I've seen his rebuttals to Darren and Diego, but I've yet to see one about Trey. I'm going to cover a lot in this video, so strap in. This is going to be one hell of a ride. I first have to make a disclaimer, and that is to not harass anyone mentioned in this video, and that this is simply a critique of David Peters' work. Nothing more, nothing less. So, who is David Peters? As mentioned earlier, Peters is a once reliable paleo artist. His earlier works are honestly pretty decent. He's made quite a few books, and all these were made when his work was decent for the time. But now his work is, uh, how do I put this, uh, less reliable. I'll admit, he does have some standards. For instance, if you look at his earlier reconstructions, they are a lot stranger than they are now. But still, his stuff is strange. First of all, I'm just going to quickly point out a few things on his website, reptileevolution.com. So, three things that I noticed are in the dinosaur area. First is calling Acrocanthosaurus adocensis Acrocanthosaurus triassicus. I, why did you put it like that? Acrocanthosaurus is from the Cretaceous, not the Triassic, but... And second is using 1800 skeletals and stuff for ceratosaurus. You may be wondering why that's a big deal, and the reason is there are pages with species described in 2022, which is Meraxes gigas. So why are there 1800 skeletals being used? Third, and finally, the page on Minmai. Look, Peters, the reconstruction you've made for Minmai is not possible. The specimen you used for your skeletal diagram is now considered to be the holotype for Kunbarasaurus. And last time I checked, Kunbarasaurus is a parenchylosaurian, which means it doesn't have a tail club, it has a hacksaw. Sorry to interrupt this video, uh, it's editing stew here. Uh, I forgot to mention something, as I didn't find out before. So, in a phylogenetic diagram made by Peters, he separated the juvenile Triceratops and the uh, adult Triceratops. He did the same thing to Chasmosaurus and Massospondylus. Peters, would you please care to explain how the juvenile-slash-embryo of a species is different enough from the adults that they are their own branch on a phylogenetic tree. I'd like to get into one of his theories that isn't about pterosaurs and what he thinks are pterosaur related animals, but one of his theories is that baleen whales aren't whales but desmostylians, and to that I shall use his own point against him that he used in his article about homotherium. Don't forget convergence. Also, fun fact. Baleen whales, a.k.a. mysticetids, originated before Desmostylians. The oldest Desmostylian that I can find is Behemotops, which dates back 33.9 million years. And the oldest baleen whale I can find is Mystiacodon, which dates back around 36.4 million years. Before I get into the longest part of the video, I'd like to go over his response to Dino Diego. So, uh, in your article, you said, and I quote, 
You reported Peters is not a qualified paleontologist. That is true. I have no science degree from a university, as anyone, e.g. Carl Sagan, comma, Charles Darwin, can tell you, anyone can do science. All right. Look, Peters, I think you fail to realize that you can't just make theories about fields you have no degree in. Uh, you want to know what happened last time someone did that? We got Too Big to Walk, a book written by Brian J. Ford, who is, and I must say this, is more qualified than you. He still doesn't have a degree in paleontology, and he wrote a book on how sauropods couldn't walk on land because they couldn't hold up their own weight. And this guy has a degree in biology. You don't have a degree in science. But anyway, you then mentioned that you've been traveling the world to examine specimens. And, dude, based on a lot of your articles, you use Photoshop to examine fossils. Okay, then you ask when someone becomes a paleontologist. And the answer is you officially become a paleontologist when you get your degree. Then you show that some assumptions about your theories were made and part of your defense is valid that these assumptions only apply to certain pterosaurs. One that I'm going to go over now, because I'll go over the other one later, is the two nostrils on Pterodactylus scolopaciceps. I must say, you're using Photoshop. I'm going to go over this because I'd like to point out that you, only you, have noticed this thing on this species of pterodactylus. I wonder why the people who actually described it haven't noticed it, or anyone else in later studies. Also, you mentioned how soft crests are evident in fossils like Pterorhynchus and Tapayara, but what is this weird dewlap-like thing you added onto Pterorhynchus? And what about the things you did to Thalassodromius and Tupor You also retort the claim that you are unreliable by stating that your examination of Pterandon was considered reliable in a paper. Uh, I, I have to say it. Uh, that is one paper based on one thing you did. Consider for one second that literally all of the other ones, all the other papers, say that all your other theories are wrong. And now it is time for the most iconic part of Peters' work, which are the pterosaurs and what Peters thinks are close related relatives. Anyways, Peters, please, please tell me where you got this photo of the full skeleton of Lungus Squama and why literally no other paleontologist has mentioned it in a paper. Now on to Kosasaurus. I hate to bring this up again, but you're using Photoshop again. Tell me, Peters, why are you the only person to see this crest on the skull? And why no other paleontologist has acknowledged it? Also, looking at your skeletal and then looking at the article, I see no need for things on its back and legs. Also, hey, hey Peters, uh, where are you getting these crests on Pterodostro and Nothosaurus? I see zero evidence of it in any of your pages. Also, Peters, it seems like you believe that we have a 31 species of Rampharynchus, and don't you dare say that Oh, some of those are different genera. You can't say that because the diagram is literally called the genus Rampharynchus. Also, with your Jehelopterus thing, it's a 2D fossil. You can't really tell that it had those things on its back. Also, why do all of your anaerognathids look genetically malformed. This specimen of Jehelopterus looks like you hit in the head with a sledgehammer. Your anaerognathus looks like it's in constant agony. I don't 
think that you can really get that much information about the skull shape from 2D fossils, considering, you know, they have no way to tell how the whole shape of the skull was. And uh, the last pterosaur I'll go over is Quetzalcoatlus. Please, please enlighten me, Peters, where the evidence for that soft tissue crest is. Because from what I can see, you just added that for effect. Anyway, that's all my mental health can take. This video has taken me too long to make and has given my mental health a heart attack multiple times over. So I'll see you guys in the next time. And don't trust pterosaurheresies.com or reptileevolution.com.